Okay, so I hope I haven't depressed you too much by now. Because now we're kind of getting into the core of it. Kind of going back to the beginning again. Very first episode. Truth be free. Why Evil is was the title of it. And there were a lot of audios that went with it. In the very first episode of this series of God Deeds. Evil is allowed. And even not quite endorsed, but definitely insured. So that it can be free to be what it is and go where it goes and does what it does. When you stop to think about the implications of that, you can begin to understand why the atheist says there's no God. What kind of God would, in effect, ensure evil? And God's very upfront about this. I don't know why it's not taught more often, maybe because it's upsetting. Calvinists have no end of trouble with it, and yet at the same time are the most the biggest proponents of it. Um, they say, and they're not exactly right, but they're close, that God created evil. They do say that. They say that because they're not looking too closely at the Hebrew of uh, Isaiah 45, 7. 7, verses 7 through 9. Um, Hebrew word there is ra'ah, and it's usually translated evil. Should be tra- it's used as a substantive, um, and therefore should be translated the evil one, meaning Satan. Satan was created, he was free to be whatever he wanted, and he wanted to go against God, and that's how evil came into the world. Now, Augustine had no end of trouble trying to figure all this out. He wrote something called a treatise on the free will or something. I've, I've got it around here somewhere. But Augustine couldn't think his way out of a paper bag. And he was full of bombast and he loved to argue and create straw men. So he never figured it out. His alleged purpose in writing that was to say, okay, well, do we have free will or not? And if we have free will, is that meritorious? And if we have free will, then how did evil get here? And a whole bunch of other things that just confused him no end. Confused Calvin, too, who was a fan of Augustine. Both of them missing the point. God exists. He can be whatever he wants. He can will whatever he wants. So far, so good. They got that. What they never counted on was that God wills that everything be free because he is truth be free because I am God and I am free and I am truth and I want the truth that exists apart from me itself to be free just like I am. So he created truth to exist apart from him independent of him. Free. Well, that sounds really good until you think about it. If truth is going to be free, it's going to have to be free to be bad. And if it's independent of God, you can just wall bet it's going to be bad. And he's going to ensure that? What kind of God will do that? And Satan's big argument is that God is somehow a masochist, because it's hurt, you know, going against him, and a sadist because it's going against everything he creates. Okay, you're a God, you can't get hurt. Really, he can't. We call sin an offense, we call sin wrong, and those things are true too, but they can't hurt God. They can only hurt the person who sins. And Jesus Christ who took on sin, and yet himself never sinned. But his taking on sins that hurt him, that Father imputed to him, that didn't hurt God. It didn't hurt him. It didn't compromise anything at all. But Jesus Christ wanted something that he could give to God. And what did he have to give to God except himself? 
So God gave him something to do that would give. And that was a free will choice too. But of course, you know, it's going to kind of look like masochism and sadism to us. And rightly so. That's Satan's argument right there. Because this whole plan was disclosed to the angels before man was created. That was going to be the reason why man was going to be created. It wasn't the first reason that we were here to, you know, resolve the angelic conflict. That was a reason that was proximate cause. The nearest reason. Proximate means nearest. Or near. It wasn't the first reason. Hi, I'm going to make inferior creatures to you, angels, so that you can see that it's not upsetting to me that you're inferior to me. How else are they going to learn that? They got to have a creature so much lower than themselves so they can see it's not demeaning to be lower and that it's not um, boring to be higher. I had trouble with the same question myself because I think it's very much boring to be higher. I don't like it at all. But I'm not offended by what's lower exactly. Only when it's willfully stupid. God isn't bored. God isn't offended. By anything. How else to learn that unless you have this variation from top to bottom. Okay, but then... That's an application of truth be free. One other reason for truth to be free. But the first reason is truth must be free. So the first reason for creation was to show what freedom is. So that every creature has the opportunity to freely choose what he wants. For creation, that's the first reason. God's choosing it, the first reason was God wanted to be free in the first place. Because he wants truth to be independent and free to be what it is. Corollary. That every creature gets to determine for himself what to do with who he is and what he is and what's around him. And that becomes a kind of truth, too. So God is choosing what truth will be. The Calvinists are real big on that, and they're absolutely right. Yes, God chooses what truth will be. But the choice God made, this is what the Calvinists don't get, the choice God made was truth be free. Therefore, you do have free will. Calvinists don't get that. God's sovereign decision was, hi, you're going to have an independent existence, and yes, you will have free will. You will have so much free will that whatever you decide truth is, that's what it's going to be for you. So if to you the truth ought to be that your mother, your brother, your father, your sister is everything in the universe, then that's how it's going to be for you. That's not how it's going to be for the universe. That is how it's going to be for you. You can change your mind and have the truth be something else. And when you're six months old, two months old, one year old, five years old, your whole universe is really small compared to the actual universe and, of course, compared to God. But to you, that's everything. And if in your mind you remain small like that, even when your body grows mature, then that's your soul. Your soul's definition of the truth is something that you come to buy into with your own free will 
and you are programming your soul and your thoughts and your mind to determine what your world is to you. And you integrate with it. And you die with it. And the real horror in my... I keep going over this. The real horror to me is this is the way it stays. Even after death. Even in heaven. People hardwire their souls for the reality they want reality to be. And that's the way they live their lives even after death. I don't know about you, but I've been around quite a number of really petty people in my time. So much so that I prefer to be alone. The woman who characteristically spends her whole life primping how she looks, who she knows, what kind of invitation she got to what party, who said what to whom, did she get a compliment? Did everybody remember her birthday? Me, 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 me. Do you know how many women are like that? They're unbearable. Of course, they make the economy go round. You couldn't have Bergdorf Goodman without them. But you know what? The men aren't a whole lot better. They're taught from early life not to talk like that, but they think like that. And therefore, it's all about how much power they get and how much recognition they get and how much achievement they get. And that's their self-worth. And the bigger the car and the nicer the apartment or the house or the bigger the salary or the number of awards you got on your desk, that means you're important. And of course, if you're important, everybody's supposed to kowtow to you. And if they don't, well, you're going to call it lack of respect. Huh? That's me, 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 male style. Now, there are a whole lot of people who just aren't like that. Most of us are somewhere in between. The happiness that you get in life, oddly enough, ironically, is when your mind is off the me. When you're watching a movie and it's about somebody else, and you're totally into that other thing. Or maybe you have this hobby of, of building little toy boats. You know, those model kits that were so famous in the 1950s where you can make a cutty sark. That was the name of a ship originally, not whiskey. And you'd spend hours sanding some wood, working on your in your garage. That's how fathers used to spend Saturdays. They were awake all they were away all week long at their job. They'd come home at 5 or 6. Mama had to have dinner on the table and look like she just walked, you know, out of a beauty pageant. And the little girls and the little boys were all dressed up in their little pinafores and the, the ties and all that good stuff. Everybody dressed for dinner in those days. Actually, dinner was at 8. Not before. He came home at 6, then you had cocktails, and then at 8, you sat down to dinner. And on Saturday, one of the only two days that they were actually all together as a family, he'd spend most of Saturday in the garage puttering with his car or a radio or sanding something, and that was enjoyment, true, real enjoyment. And Mama would be doing something in the sewing room or somewhere else. They would be paying attention to something that wasn't themselves and wasn't the family. 
and they really enjoyed it. Or the man would go out on a golf course. A lot of men did it on Sunday morning so they could avoid church. In other words, the happiest times of your life you're going to look back on were times when you were alone. And you weren't paying attention to anybody, even yourself. You were focused on something outside of you. On it. And it usually involves some kind of creative process. Creative process or fix-it process. Rescue or creation. Well, where do you think you get that enjoyment from? So real happiness is bigger than the me. Real happiness is somehow related to creating, fixing, rescuing something or someone else. Just like you probably enjoy a movie and you can go to a movie and you just, because <gasps> you're looking at what? Somebody else's life. Somebody else's story, not yours. You get away from yourself for a while. And guess what? That's really enjoyable. So the big hint is that all these souls that have been so preoccupied with the me down here, they happen to believe in Christ at some moment. And then they're dead, and they're in heaven, and for the first time, they really get to look at something other than themselves, and luxuriate in someone other than themselves. And that's why it's called heaven. You don't have to mess with yourself. You're whoever you are, and you got whatever slot you got. And that slot is pretty much determined by the kind of soul that you chose to have while you were down here. And whatever you chose as your reality down here, that's what you're going to get. So the lady who was all concerned about being a fashion plate and thought that self-worth was how she looked, well, she's probably going to look really great in heaven. Only that, from what I understand, there's no male or female. But, you know... There's a spectrum of interest. So whatever it is she's going to be doing in heaven is going to be related to looks. And she's going to be an it. We're all going to be it's, I guess. Not going to matter much. We've got better things to do than concern ourselves with our gender. And we'll be, I don't know, have some job in heaven that's related to something pretty. And how it looks, because how it looks has been her preoccupation and therefore her expertise that she chose while down here. So that's what she gets in heaven. Now the kings of heaven chose to have an expertise in knowing God. Everybody down here is choosing something. Something that they're real interested in. I'm not talking about an expertise that you have to have that you don't want. I'm talking about the things you're expert in that you want. Because heaven's supposed to be about what you want, right? Everybody gets what he wants from God. Everybody became expert in something down here. A certain kind of soul path. And you obtained varying degrees of success in this thing you became expert in that you loved. So, that created a certain soul pattern in you that you wanted. So heaven is that pattern. I'm not talking about something that you became expert in that you didn't want. It's what you did want. 
That's what you become. And I don't mean that if you were an actor in this life, you know, and you became something of a success in this life as an actor, that you're going to be stuck being an actor in heaven. No, no, no. It has to do with the way your internal soul works. Your whole thought process and what you were doing and why you did what you did. It might translate into an entirely different occupation. We're all going to have something to do. And it's all going to still be about society and being together, except for the first time. It's going to actually be enjoyable. And you don't have to focus on the me. That whole concept of me, 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 me. It's not even going to, you're not even going to care about it. It's not even going to be interesting. You're going to be far more happy to be looking at everybody else and the only function and the purpose of the me is you can do something with the me for that somebody else. And of course, the number one somebody else everybody's going to care about is God. Except they ain't going to know him. The kings know him. They became expert at knowing him while they were down here. That's why they're kings in heaven. Because the one thing everybody's going to want once they're dead is to know him. But they can't because they didn't elect it down here. So they don't have the mechanism for knowing him. It will be provided. It's promised as being provided. Jeremiah 13. What was it? Jeremiah 3, 16 and 31. 31 through 34. Somewhere in there. Jeremiah 31 for sure. It's quoted in Hebrews 12. Chapter 8, verses 8 through 12, and then also in Hebrews 10 as a bookend, the other bookend. Hebrews 10, what? Verses 15 through 17, where he reverses the order of heart and mind in the Hebrews 10 requote. My pastor paid a lot of attention to that when he was exegeting it to show how church age is the reverse of the Old Testament. Yeah, it goes into your heart and then into your mind. Or it goes into your mind and then into your heart. Well, how can that be? Well, you can memorize. And then I believe. Okay? That's the way it was for Israel. Deuteronomy 30 is sort of like in view there. I haven't finished going through the exegesis of the book of Hebrews because there's so many chapters that in a, a prior Bible that it's like tying together when it writes. Um, when I say it, I don't really know who the author is. I'm beginning to think it was Luke. Luke or uh, possibly Mark. Especially because of the way Book of Hebrews is written to align with the outline of the Book of Mark, which was definitely written at the at, in the year of the four emperors, probably AD 69. I'm still playing with what month. The point is that those guys who wrote the Bible wanted to know God. They became experts at knowing God, which made them prize and everything else. Because this world doesn't like it if you want to know God. So, and, you know, it's time consuming. So that's why, really, you know, friendship with God is enmity with the world, not because you're supposed to, you know, go be a hermit, but because people don't like it if you're interested in God. And if you're interested in God, you're not interested in other things, because interest in anything is sort of all-encompassing and addictive. You get interested in shoes, you're going to get more and more interested in shoes, the more you get interested in shoes. And then people who are not as interested in shoes as you are, well, you know, they're going to start to fall off. Okay, well, it's the same thing with God. You're more interested in God than anybody else around you. And so you're going to want to talk about what you're interested in, or you're not going to be interested in listening to other people talk about something you're not interested in. So there's going to be sort of a rift, spoken or not. And you get isolated. And, you know, ideally, you, you find other people whose interests agree with yours. 
and you start to congregate more with them. And those whose interests are lesser than yours, you don't see so much. Well, that's how it goes. See, to the human race, God is just a variable. Not a real person. He's like a genie you rub when you want something. Knowing him for himself is not what the human race wants. The human race is interested in itself. And everything that it praises and prides on is related to itself. Even its ideas of God are all about the world, the world, the world. Convert the world. It's completely sickening to listen to most Christians. Because all they talk about are worldly things. Converting the world. Soul winning. No, how about just knowing God for God? Oh, but that doesn't have anything to do with people. So therefore it must be wrong. I've had so many people tell me, What are you studying Bible for? You're supposed to go out and win souls or do good for people. That's what being a Christian is. No, being a Christian means being of Christ. Don't you want to know the Lord who made you? Well, of course, God is love. That's what you do. Is you go out and work for people. And that, that's God's love. No, that's working for people. It has nothing to do with God. People don't want to know God. Okay, so then they're not going to be experts in God. So they can't rule. Of course, once you start to understand what ruling is, you don't want to rule. But it's a choice here. This is a big problem with the whole thing. If you want to be close to God and you want to know God, this is the price of it. Because they don't want to know God. They're going to be expert in all kinds of other things. They're going to be mature in all kinds of other things, but not Him. So if you want to be mature in Him, expert in him maturation and expertise are the same thing and we're not talking about sinning here we're talking about knowing how well do you know X here X is Christ that determines your future both down here and in eternity if it's God you want to know, then it's God you're going to know. Because God wants you to want get what you want. Okay, but if you want to know God, then you're the, one of the few. And you're going to be one of the few who's going to have to be in a ruling position because that's what the ruler has to do is know God. Because the hoi polloi don't know God. They know other things. They need a ruler. God has taken on humanity. Jesus Christ. Father, nobody sees. Son, everybody sees. But hello, he's taken on a body. So he isn't going to be visible to everybody 24-7. He's going to be on like a circuit. With 144,000 in his personal entourage. All throughout eternity. Or maybe not throughout eternity, but I can't really prove yet if the 144,000 are only his entourage during the millennium. Might be eternity too. Pretend it is for sake of argument. Okay, if he needs that many just for the millennium, then he's going to need many more for, the, for eternity. And an entourage represents... You know, you can't just walk up to Buckingham Palace and say, Hi, I'd like to see the Queen now. No, you have to go through 13,222 representatives before you can get an audience with the Queen. And the Queen's own schedule is set up like five years in advance. So even if you get an audience, it'll be five years from now. Well, what do you think it's going to be like with Jesus Christ? Okay, well, I, I, don't, I don't, you know, hello. I don't want to wait a thousand years till he next comes into my section of the universe in order to see him. Well, then I'm going to have to be a ruler. And then I'm going to be his representative to my kingdom. Because there's that many. 
It only takes a nanosecond to believe in Christ. It's really easy to do when you're desperate. I'm sure a lot of people who call themselves atheists did it. People who make an issue of being an atheist usually make an issue of being an atheist because they did believe in Christ and something happened during their childhood or sometime in the past that made them get upset about the fact they believed in Christ. So now they make a big stink about being atheists. I have this, this terrible suspicion that heaven is just burgeoned. There's so many. Because it's so easy to be saved. And the story, the Bible story, is so ridiculous that it's transversed, you know, I'm sure, every single year since this started. Since Adam started talking. The story is so ridiculous. That everybody knows if only to pass on the story because it's so ridiculous. I mean, stop to think about how ridiculous the Bible really is. Yeah, and if it's ridiculous, then you want to ridicule it. If you want to ridicule it, you want to repeat it. And those are the three R's. Real, ridiculous, repeated. So there's no way people don't know the gospel from time immemorial. And yeah, they laugh at it. For all you know, they laugh at it. Yeah, but you don't know those quiet moments between 12 and 3 in the morning when their heart skips a beat and they wonder if they're going to die. And at that moment, God zings the gospel back into their memory and it's like, okay, I believe. And then the crisis passes. And they go back to sleep and they forgot that they believed, but God didn't forget you know how many people are standing in front of heaven or dying today? It's totally surprised that they went to heaven. Some of the worst people you'll ever meet and some of the best. And some of the best people you'll ever meet are waking up this morning in hell. Thinking of how righteous they were and religious they were and all the money they gave to charity and everything. But when they had their desperate moments, they didn't believe ever that's the reality they chose that's the reality they get they can always change the reality that they chose because God is says truth be free you want truth to be that I'm a bad person and you don't want to believe in me okay here's how this is the alternative there's the only alternative left you can change it any time by changing your mind and believing that my son paid for your sins. Because I already got paid. But if you don't want the inheritance that he paid for by my decree, okay, it'll just sit here. Forever waiting for you to change your mind. Meanwhile, you can have the reality that you want, your own home alone, in hell right now, lake of fire later. And every single day those people are in hell. They know that. And they keep on choosing that as their reality. They don't want to go to heaven. They'd rather shake their fist at God. Topside here before death. And downside there after death. And later in the lake of fire. Post everybody's death. So the bottom line about integrated hypocrisy is that if you want hypocrisy to be your life, you can have it. Truth is whatever you want it to be, even when it's not true. Because God says truth be free. And since God, truth exists because God says, then you can say what you want the truth to be. Even when it's not true, he's going to ensure that your version of reality gets to be what you have. I can't think of a more frightening thought than that. I do not like 
what I've been saying all along. This whole God's Eat series. I do not like the fact that in order to be close to him, I gotta learn how to rule people. Because I don't want to rule anybody. I don't even want to rule myself. I just want to be free. Well, hello, freedom depends on rule. If you don't rule yourself, you can't be free. That's the irony of it. So God ruled, truth be free. And that's the origin of it. So you have to rule what reality is for you. I have to rule what reality is for me. And, you know, how do you do that? Well, you need facts. Okay, but these are the facts. You can say, well, how do you know, brain out? Ask God yourself. I'm all ears for any better truth than what I've been saying. Because I don't like this. But where is there a better answer? Satan's busy saying, well, this is a bad answer. Yeah, okay. Show me a better one. And that's why God's letting this whole thing go on. Part of truth be free is high. You got a better answer than, than my decree that truth be free? Let me know. And he means it. Satan really does have the opportunity to prove God wrong. That's what this whole story is about. God says truth be free. Satan says that's a bad plan. God says, okay, show me something better. And then discloses the whole deal if you study scripture long enough. And if you want to know God enough rather than my brother, my father, my sister, my mother, my fashion plate life. If you study it long enough, this is what you find. And it's not completely unknown. There have been all kinds of movies and plays and literature written about this. The whole Mephisto concept. The whole thing in Dostoevsky of the Grand Inquisitor. More recent stuff is like, what was it, the movie The Devil's Advocate. The soliloquy by Al Pacino at the end of the movie. People kind of know this, but we're not giving it enough attention. This is the reality God created because he says, I want reality to be truth independent of me and free. With all of its causes, conditions, successions, and relations, and determining its certain futurition. You'll hear that in seminary. That's the decree of God. What they leave out is that his decree is truth be free. Truth be. And what kind of being is it? Free. Free of God. Free to be whatever it is. Therefore we are free to choose God or it or something else and we like God can decree the truth be whatever we want for our lives even when it's not true because it's got to be free so he will ensure that you can make it try to be whatever you want forever and if what you want is well God what I want is you Okay, well, here's a bunch of truths to go with that. Namely, that everybody else doesn't want me. There are very few who do. And those few who do, if you stay with me, I will grow you. And yes, you will know me. And yes, you'll be close to me. But honey, you're going to have to rule these other people in eternity because they didn't want to know me. And once they're dead, they will. So who's going to be my representative to them since they can't get close to me even as the people in Israel wouldn't get close to the mountain when Moses wanted to get close. So Moses got close. The people were afraid. They didn't get close. So Moses was, their rep was God's representative to them. They didn't see God. They saw Moses. Well, that's how it is in eternity too. 
if you're the king, they see you, you're God's representative, they don't see him. Well, you know, like every once, once in a thousand years or something, when he happens to come to your city-state, or maybe it's the size of France, I'm expecting that most of the kingdoms in heaven are about the size of France, about 60, 70 million people per kingdom, but that could be just flat off. When he comes to your country, Then you see the top of his head, or well, I don't know, maybe he's wearing a crown, the crown on his head, or you see the three fingers as he waves. And you can say, I saw Jesus Christ. And then you'll be talking about that event of the three seconds you saw his three fingers for the next thousand years. And that will be a joy to the hoi polloi. They're going to replay and replay and replay whatever his last visit was until his next visit. Meanwhile, you're there. And everything everybody makes and does and talks about in some way is going to have to do with you because you're his representative and everybody's going to be watching every move you make just like the gossips watch, you know, the Inquirer at the grocery store. They buy that little tabloid. to gossip about what the people in the tabloid are doing. Oh, this movie star had to go to a rehabilitation center. This other movie star has gained 10 pounds. Look at that photograph of that belly. That's the way their minds work. In heaven. So you see, it's a pretty hard choice. And I don't like this. But what are you going to do? Truth should be free, right? 